Tonight, I'm going to teach to you about uh, tough questions if eternal security is false. Tough questions you have to answer if eternal security is false. There's a lot of people who do not believe once saved, always saved. For some of you who do not know what that means, it simply means this. If you as a repentant sinner told the Lord that I believe what you did on Calvary to save my soul, once you did that, you're saved no matter what. What if I sin in the future? You're still saved no matter what. What if I live very wickedly? You're still saved no matter what. Well, you can't just tell a person who receives Christ for his or her salvation that, oh, they're saved and they haven't been to church for a long time or uh, they end up becoming a full-fledged uh, evil liberal or even committing like really despicable sins. Like some of them can become atheists or homosexuals and etc., well, uh, you got to understand this. You are saved no matter what. Right. Now, that's unbelievable to people. Right. And the reason why is because one, uh, well, before I get to the feelings of the people, I want to ask them this. Here are tough questions that you have to answer. These are very tough questions you have to answer. If you really deny this doctrine and think, no, I think that a person was not genuinely saved to begin with, or a person is going to burn in hell, because they're a wicked sinner, uh, because I don't see fruits from their lives, and etc., then we're going to have to go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. I think this is the best place to start. Matthew 7, I can't tell you how this was abused by Ray Comfort and so many people who keep demanding from others, I need to see fruit out of your life. If I don't see fruit out of your life, then you are not a saved believer. So that's what they're going to keep claiming. Now, if you demand that we have to see uh, fruits out of their lives, the question is this. The question that they have to answer is, okay, we need to see fruit out of your lives and we can't see, uh, you can't commit, uh, keep committing these wicked sins, otherwise you're not genuinely saved. Then my question is, first question, oh, uh, I don't want to use a black pen, I want to use uh, a blue pen over here. And please don't be sensitive. This is not a political reason, all right? I just want to use a blue pen. Please, YouTube, don't, 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 okay, please, okay? I'm begging for your pardon. And nowadays, okay, you know what I mean. All right, anyways, first question is what amount of fruit? So you're telling me I have to see a significant amount of fruit within the life of an individual and that person is a safe Christian. All right, then uh, my question to you is this. So then are you telling me that a person who actually is a pastor who tells people about the Bible and who does a lot of good deeds for people and elevates the name of Jesus Christ that that person's a saved person. Yes, that person's a saved Christian. You know what you're judging him by? You're not judging him by his faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. You're judging him by his fruits, which is the works that he did out of his life. So you're judging by what he did rather than what Jesus Christ did for him. That's your problem. The problem that... Uh, Plus, you got another issue. Another issue is up to what amount of fruit? Up to what amount of fruit? So then uh, you're telling me that you're God and you are God that you can say, okay, this is the right amount of fruit and you're saying, well, this is not the right amount of fruit. You're wrong. I mean, there are Christians who go to church and love Jesus Christ, but they just don't come to church anymore. So then is that person lost or saved? Let me give another one. Let's say a person went to church nearly all of his life and loved Jesus Christ, served God better than you did. All of a sudden had a falling out and then all of a sudden went to liberal universities and all of a sudden became brainwashed and became an atheist. Saved or lost? Uh, let me uh, get into that, okay? Let me get into something else. Okay, so then if you judge these people as lost, then up to what amount of fruit is the person saved? So then you're judging your level, not Scripture. Not Scripture. Did you hear what I said? Not Scripture. You're not giving me a Scripture. Which perfect level?
level, give me a specific up to which level of fruit that you're saved and which level you're lost. You can't, can you? You know why? You're judging by your own bias and preconception. You're not judging by scripture. Let me show you scripture, all right? And I hear so many people talking about, I had dreams or visions, or, you know, I've done even miracles for the Lord. Uh, I've, uh, I've done so many works for his name. Okay, you can do that, but guess what? If you're judging by those fruits, the Bible says you're lost. Matthew 7. Matthew 7. This is the favorite proof text that people will use, like Ray Comfort and etc., to make you doubt your salvation and you're scared. Look at this. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits he shall know them. So see, you have to judge by the fruits of the individual where you can see the person is saved or lost. Ah, but look at this. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And thy name have cast out devils? And thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, look at this, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice God considers these people lost. So here's the funny thing. Ray Comfort and some of these people will say, so notice over here that you have to follow the will of the Father. You have to have good fruits. You have to be very serious about this. Otherwise, just like these people, you'll think you're a Christian, but you're actually not a Christian. You can go to hell. You know why they went to hell? Look what they're trusting in. They never said, I trust in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful what? Works. works. They're trusting in their works for salvation. Look at that one. So see, if you go by this status about saved or lost, then I would be scared if I were you. Well, why did the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them? Simple. Because uh, it's so simple by the fruits of the Spirit. Go to the book of, oh, what's a good passage about uh, start, starting good work in you? Go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. The fruit comes out by the Holy Spirit, yes? All right. If the fruit comes out by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit, what the fruit that's going to produce is, you're not relying on your works. You're not relying on what you call fruits. The Holy Spirit is the one producing the fruits. Why? Because you depended on Him, Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Him for salvation, and the Holy Spirit's job is to produce the fruits. And guess what? It goes all the way till the end of, uh, till the day of Jesus Christ. This is powerful. I don't know how you're going to overthrow this one. Let's look at first of Ephesians 2, all right? Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. So look, we're not denying, we're not saying a person has zilch fruit and he has absolutely zero fruit in his life and then he goes to heaven. I'm not saying that. Of course, the Holy Spirit works in you and there's fruit, but your problem is this. Your problem is you're judging by a certain level of fruits. Didn't you know that you can be a baby Christian and produce little fruit for the Lord? Didn't you know that you can be a big Christian producing big fruits for the Lord? And you Christians who think you got an amount of fruit that considers you saved, you better be careful of that. That's a level of pride. Then you're bringing people to your level. At least you're in my level. Then you're saved. Who are you? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8 through 10. Look at this. This, is, this verse is so important. You're not saved by works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's absolutely not by works that you're saved. You can't rely on that. Now look at this part. For we are his workmanship. So see, there is fruit and there is work. We don't deny it. But look at this part. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works 
which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now notice that Christ is the one, the Holy Spirit. He is the one producing the fruit and the work. Now, here's the thing. God Almighty is the one that created you. He put it a spiritual nature within you. If there's something that we believe in, we believe in two natures, the nature of the flesh and the nature of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the problem with the other side. The other side's problem is that they think that they believe in basically an eradication of the flesh or basically the flesh being dominated by the spirit. It's becoming really low. But no, that's a false doctrine. Because the flesh can grow more than the spirit. So we believe in two natures. So basically right here, the outer man is the flesh. There are two natures within a Christian. And then the inner nature is the spirit. What happens nature is not eliminated and this fleshly nature is not eliminated. So in other words, fleshly nature is not eliminated. What does that mean? This fleshly nature, you're capable of doing things. So if you feed your flesh more, guess what happens? It grows more. And it's the same thing with the spiritual nature. You feed it more, it's going to grow more. So look, we don't deny fruit and work because we also deny elimination of the spirit. See, you have a spiritual nature within you. When you sin, the Bible says, uh, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You get a conscience. You get guilt. Um, you have a desire to do what's right. Or the Lord will chastise you to produce fruit, etc. That happens within saved believers' life. However, here's the problem. The problem that you deny is that you, don't, you deny that this flesh can grow bigger than the spirit. Because you do know, if you're an honest person, no matter how much Jesus Christ spanks you or the Holy Spirit does work in your life, that you still rebel and you let the flesh grow bigger than the other nature. See, you know what their knowledge is? Their Bible knowledge is shallow. They're only looking at the outer man. Look at the change I did, I did, I did. You're looking at your flesh and you see that becomes dangerous. If you're looking at the outer nature of your flesh then are you looking at the works of your flesh? And that makes me even question you even more that are you relying on your works for your salvation by what your flesh did rather than how the Holy Spirit was working in your life? That's my mind because look what verse 10 says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You notice that? God's the one who put that in you. Yes, Not you. God's the one that put it in you. He created that inside you to do good works. And that is done by what? Verse 8 and 9, if you choose not to rely on your work to begin with. I am sick and tired of these people who try to mingle faith and works together. And then Ray, uh, Ray Comfort, he'll give lines like, well, you need to quit this sin and stop this sin first and make sure you read your Bible. He doesn't get that person to immediately tell Christ, I trust in what you did on the cross for salvation. Not by works. When you do that, verse 8 and 9... Then what happens? Verse 10, the Holy Spirit can start working in you. See, comfort told them in their flesh, in their lost condition, they have to stop doing these things first. That's troubling. Amen. That's troubling to me. That's heresy. That's plainly wrong. That's plainly wrong. You know what happens when people get saved and receive Christ for their salvation? Then we start telling them, you need to quit doing this and you need to start working that. Don't we do that? Yeah, we do that after they get saved. Not to try out their salvation and to do it in order to get saved or to make them think that they were never saved to begin with, so they need to do that to get saved. What in the world? So you're in Christ Jesus, right? So if that's done in Christ Jesus, look at this one. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Notice that I'm starting to prove one saved, one, uh, one saved, always saved, with the proof text that people use to make you doubt your salvation. Isn't that funny? The Lord's verses in trying to make you assured of your salvation are actually used by the wicked ones to make you doubt your salvation. 
Now, here's another text where they used to make you doubt your salvation, but it shouldn't be. Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as uh, in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whoa, so, so you need to work to get saved. It didn't say work in order to get saved. It says work out your salvation. Why? Because you already have salvation in you. How can you work out salvation if salvation was never inside you to begin with? Salvation has to go in you so that you can do it out. That's why Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You're not saved by works. All right, you're saved by grace through faith. But in order to do the works, which is true, Catholics' works don't count. All right? That's why in order to do works for the Lord, you need to what? Get saved first by faith without a single work so that you can do the works out. Ephesians 2.10. 2 2 now you can be his workmanship. People, people say at verse 12, you have to obey the Lord though. Remember Matthew 7? You have to follow the will of the Father. You know how you obey God and do his will? Don't be saved by works and don't rely on it. Why don't you trust in my son for salvation? You know what disobedience is? You know what not following the will of God is? You spit on that promise and you say, no, Lord, I'll do it my way, outwardly, how I do things out of my own life. Look at verse 13. Answered already verse 12. For it is God which worketh in you. See that? It explains why you can work out. Because God worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So notice that God works in you. So once salvation's in you, the Lord is able to work in you so that you can let it out. Notice the wording matched with Ephesians 2.10 already. See, God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Philippians chapter 2, verse... Uh, oh, what was that again? Uh, 12 through 13, see? And then compare that now with Romans 8, 28. And then we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1. All right, let me show you something. This will prove once saved, always saved. You ready for this one? And then maybe we'll add Hebrews. Uh, no, no, I won't add Hebrews. Let's, let's just go here, okay? This should be good enough. Go to Romans 8, 28. Now, this is a wonderful promise. Basically, the bad and the good that you do in life, all things work together for good, right? Yep. Bad and good, right? That's a wonderful promise. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So then, this is bad and good. Why? Because he says all things. The Bible says, and we know that what? All things. Oh, no, 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 not when you mess up here. Then you violate his promise of Romans 8, 28. God can work anything for good. Even the sins that I've done? Yeah. You might say, no, he don't work that for good. Are you kidding me? You deny God's promise here, one. And number two, you think God is too weak and shallow that he can't work your sin for good. And number three, you overlook the fact that when you live in sin, the Lord can work it for good. Why? To teach you a lesson. So that maybe you can use the sinful struggles you went through to help somebody else who's going through that one. Maybe the Lord will use it for good. How? I don't know, giving you a spanking? Didn't the, I mean, didn't you read the verses? There are too many verses. God uses the evil and the sins of even lost people for his glory, for good. He used the sins of the, Bab uh, the Babylonian nation. Why? To punish his children of Israel. He used it in that sense. Romans 8, by the way, is the favorite Calvinist passage, which boggles my mind. I don't know how Calvinists overlook this one. But if you go to uh, Romans chapter 8, which goes to Romans 9, God even uses the wicked uh, for his glory. That, 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 I don't know why they overlook that one. So following the context of Romans 8.28, it follows that pattern that no matter what God does, he does it for good. So Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
Now look at this. All things work together for good. See that? Remember, God is the one that worketh in you. Remember that at Philippians 2? There is no doubt they go hand and hand together. So all of this is God working in you, and God works that for good. And guess what? He cannot stop working in you. He has to work all the way till the rapture. He can't leave that. That proves once saved, always saved. Look at Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Oh man, I'm worried that I'm not really saved. Am I really saved? Or I'm going to miss out the rapture. Look, Paul didn't have that. He says, no, we can be confident. That's stronger than just knowing. It's confident. He says in verse 6, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing. Thing, right? Like all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28. That he which hath begun a good work in you, that matches Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. Work for good. Philipp, uh, and then Philippians 2, 13. God worketh in you. <coughs> Excuse me. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So in other words, wow, then that means then uh, that I can't lose my salvation. You're right. Even when I mess up. Yeah, you're right. Even when you sin and mess up. God can't quit working in you. You know why? You're his child. He has to chastise you. Now I guess we have to go to Hebrews. All right, go to Hebrews 12. He has to. Otherwise, he's not doing his job. Look, I got a question. If you aren't truly saved to begin with, all right, then you're not even a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, then God shouldn't have even spanked you. God has to spank you because you're his child. If he's like, oh, no, you're too sinful, you don't qualify as my child, then he doesn't have to spank him. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Look at uh, verse nine. Furthermore, we have had our fathers of our we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? See that you can die. So you can live wicked till the day you die. Why? Because God can just end your life like that. For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but He for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward he yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. See that? See that? Fruit does come out. We don't deny that. Fruit does come out. Work does come out. But your problem is, is that you think you're God the Father and you can tell when a person's fruit is out of his or her life. You don't know. You're not, the, you're not my father, I'll tell you that much. Amen. My father knows. Amen. And you don't know all the private things I go through in my life or lots of other people. You have no idea by just meeting them for five minutes that, oh, you're not really saved. Who do you think you are? You don't know their lifetime, what they went through, how the Lord worked in them. Amen. Who are you, man? All right, going back, going back. He that doeth the will of my Father, in Matthew 7, or Philippians 2, obey the Lord. And it's so simple. God says, trust in the death of my Son for salvation. And after that, I'll work out of your life. Isn't that simple? Oh, my goodness. I... All right, now, my second question, all right? So notice that this question is debunked by too much Scripture. Amount of fruit. Yeah, the Lord's going to give that person fruit. But your problem is you're inspecting which amount of fruit. And then if you do that, then you're going to be in trouble like Matthew 7, where these people rely on their works. Like, oh, here are my work and here are my fruits. And God says, no, I never knew you. He calls them workers of iniquity instead. That's scary right there. That's scary right there. All right, number two. Then let's say that, okay, then Christians, they live well. 
and they live significantly and they'll go to heaven after they die, then I have a question. Then are you saying that Christians, uh, what happens to their bad works? What are these bad works at the judgment seat of Christ? Didn't you know that? They're always looking at good works, good works, good works. Why don't you look at the bad works? You know what happens at the judgment seat of Christ concerning about the bad works? It is possible. Look, they don't look at this. You can have a significant level. You can have a large level of bad works. And then at the end, you get nothing. Why? Because your good works are hardly shown that you've grown in it. Look at this one. We're going to look at uh, the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, I, I think you're heresy and all that. Okay, then why do these people, they can get nothing at the judgment seat of Christ? What do you think God is burning? Their underwear? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He has to have bad works. They, so in other words, a saved Christian must have evil, bad works in their lives. And yes, even in this passage, a certain Christian must have works that is really evil, that he get nothing at the judgment seat of Christ. That much of a level. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice here at verse 13. Every man's what? Works work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. See, God's going to try their work and see, okay, let's see here. Not down here. Okay, let's look at your work and see if you're saved or not. It's up in heaven God's going to inspect their works. But let's see if God says, let me inspect your works here. Oh, you don't count. You're, you're going to burn in hell. You're not really saved. Well, let's see if he does that. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, see if his work survives, he shall receive a reward. Okay, so we know that's a good person. Well, what about a bad person? If any man's work shall be burned, see, so that's not a good work. So it's burned up. He shall suffer what? Lost. Lo see, he loses. He doesn't get anything. So I guess he's going to burn in hell. But he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. Look at that. The verse showed you that the fire don't touch the man. The fire does not touch the person. He gets saved out of the fire. Isn't that something? And the Bible emphasized yet so as by fire. It emphasized that. The person is saved out of the fire. That's something, man. So then, uh, I guess God was like thinking he's John MacArthur or Ray Comfort. And some people have been asking me, what's the heresy John MacArthur teaches? And that's lordship salvation. Yes, it is. Lordship salvation, for some of you who don't know, they judge people's salvation. and They say, you're not really saved. Why? Because I don't see you love Jesus and you're living your life in sin. I don't see you serving God and being a good Christian. You don't act. You don't look like a Christian. So you must be lost. I get that. That's the judgment. That's the automatic thinking of all of us. But you got to realize this. You're judging them by their actions, by their behavior, by their works, and you're looking at the wrong thing for salvation. You know what I ask for a person's testimony? I don't see them how much they love Jesus, read the Bible or come to church. And some of you, you know what I've asked you. I've asked you, what, how did you get saved? What's your testimony? Is there a time and place in your life you told God, God, I repent as a sinner, and I, all I can do is trust what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's what I'm looking for. Why? Because that's the right judgment of salvation. Not their works. You think God is judging them? You're saved, you're lost by your works here? No, he's judging them by their service here. And if a person did poorly, he don't, burn, he don't damn them. God has a different thinking from John MacArthur and Ray Comfort when he inspects people's works. Saved Christians works for the salvation. Okay, um, anyways. If you deny me that this work has to be good or bad at the judgment, then just look at Ecclesiastes 12. It's that simple. Ecclesiastes 12. At the judgment, God has to judge every work. And work is bad or good. Whether it be good or evil. Look at Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. Notice that the Bible says, verse 14, one of the best verses Solomon ever concluded out of his writings. 
The last thing he probably said, and that was probably the wisest thing that he said because he lived a very dumb life for a wise man. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, For God shall bring, what? Every work into judgment. With every secret thing, look at this line, whether it be good or whether it be evil. See, God has to judge bad works at the judgment. And that includes saved Christians. And it's even at a significant level. Because why? They get nothing at the end. Loss. You saw that. His work don't survive. It's burned and gone. How about that? All right, number three. Then uh, how about really wicked people? You're saying that wicked Christians, there's no such thing? Then what about the Bible who talks about them? I right, go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. This one, I, this one is, I think, the most judgmental thing you can ever do. The most judgmental, wicked thing you can ever do. Oh, and you're not saved. Why? Because you're still uh, living with the uh, opposite sex at the same house. Or, you know, you're still smoking, drinking, and stuff like that. Now, look, I believe in rebuking sin, okay? We believe in that. But remember, works come out after salvation. So this is after salvation. After salvation, I have to rebuke their sins, make sure they live in good works. But when I'm telling them before salvation, like you need to clean up this act to get saved and stuff like that, then you're in trouble. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. Look at this. There was incest going on in the home. You know that? There was incest going on in the home, but this guy is saved. 1 Corinthians 5.1 It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And he are, uh, look at verse 4. So this person committed the sin of taking uh, the father's wife. That's disgusting. Fornication. Look at verse 4 and 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ... To deliver such a one unto Satan. Now look at the wording, wording here. For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Did you ever see a contradiction here? Wait a minute. So this guy's turned over to the devil, but his spirit is still saved. You're right. A person can be turned over to Satan and still saved. That's how extreme the Bible goes. Well, is there a contradiction here? No. You, didn't, you don't read here. Did you remember our lesson? They overlook a basic doctrine. Two natures, flesh and spirit. They always judge you by your flesh. Flesh, flesh, if you're really saved. No, your flesh can be as evil as Satan. But the spirit can still be saved. See, I mean, uh, uh, come on, common sense. You think that this flesh is pure and holy. I don't care how perfect you live as a Christian. All of us are going to admit this. Our, sin, our flesh is sin. And God has to transform our flesh at the rapture. Then we can say that the body is free from sin. Right. To tell me that you're free from sin when you get saved and you should be living a holy life and all that, but it's okay if uh, you sin a little bit here and there, you're a hypocrite. You're saying God's power is weak. If I'm going to talk about a pure holy state and change in my life concerning about the flesh, then I'll tell you what it's going to be. It has to be 100%. 100%. See, I'm more extreme than these guys about a changed life. But it has to be the division of the flesh and the spirit. All right. Now, let's uh, look at another one. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. You know, uh, I hate to bring up this person's name, but I'm going to have to do it because I want to, I am getting very upset at these Calvinists, at these people who teach lordship salvation. Okay, I'm going to expose their hypocrisy here and now. You ready for this? And I challenge John MacArthur, Ray Comfort, Paul Washer to say this. Tell me Ravi Zacharias is lost and burning in hell. They will not say that. You know why? They, had, they sat down with him. Francis Chan, tell me that he's lost and going to hell, Ravi Zacharias. Oh, they wouldn't dare say that. You know why? He's defended the Christian faith so much. And he's done so much work for the cause of Christ. He's, 
did you see his lifestyle? His lifestyle is more wicked than some Christians who hardly came to church and don't love Jesus, don't read the Bible anymore. His lifestyle is manipulation that even lost sinners don't do. He was manipulating these people through religious means like uh, praying before they do the sexual action. You are... Okay, so... Okay, I'm getting really mad here. You consider a guy like him saved, but then other people who smoke, dance, and do fornication, all that, they're lost. They're not genuinely saved. You got a mental brain damage problem. See, you know what you're doing? Back to point number one. You're picking and choosing. You're being God. I think you're saved, but I think you're lost. See, that's pharisaical. That's wicked as hell. That's wrong. The Calvinists would jump for joy to hear that John Calvin burned somebody alive at the stake. Murder! He burned someone alive at the stake. But uh, he must be a safe person because of the, t the five points of Calvinism, lordship, salvation, and Charles Spurgeon, guess what? Uh, you think people who keep smoking marijuana that, oh, you know, you're not genuinely safe? Guess what? Charles Haddon Spurgeon had a cigar problem. Smoking issue. You didn't know that? Whoa, hey, don't let me carry on, man. I might, uh, I might knock over your Christian Calvinist heroes. Now, do I deny, am I saying that they're lost and they're going to hell? I never said that. Do I deny that uh, the Lord used them? Sure, I know that the Lord used them. But see, your problem is this. Your problem is this. You have this judgmental attitude that I can pick which sins you're lost and which good works you're saved. That's your problem. Well, because a person didn't repent of this sin and that sin, they're not saved. <laughs> Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19. Again, again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, what does he call them? Dearly beloved, right? Paul recognizes these people as beloved of God, that they're saved. If you compare that with Ephesians 1, it's even stronger. If you're part of the beloved, you're secured all the way till the rapture. Like you're predestinated and chosen and elected and all those strong Calvinist terms that, the, that is used, actually. So if you're beloved, look at this, verse 20. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be, look at these sins, debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whispering, swelling, tumult. Well, well, you know, there are Christians, saved Christians who still have that problem and they're still saved, but, you know, we're talking about wicked people here. Oh, I'm not done. Verse 21. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Those are strong words. You know how... You know what those sins are? They are dark sexual sins. How about that? How about that? They didn't repent of these. And Paul considers them dearly beloved. You know why? Because God doesn't consider your salvation where there's a checkmark list. And if there's any of you out there, I would love to see that. But there's a checkmark list of get rid of this sin. Get rid of that sin, get rid of this sin and that sin and that sin. If I did that with you in soul winning, we would go all day long. And by the way, even after you thought you repented enough, there were other sins the Lord revealed to you that you went, oh, I didn't know that I had to repent of these too. And it's not like you quit it immediately. That's why some Calvinists can't quit their sins. And they uh, justify drinking alcohol, I kid you not, they justify drinking beer, and they justify about rap music. They justify worldly dressing, and they say, I can commit these things, and I believe that if you're not saved like me, and don't commit as much sin like me, glug, 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 then you're lost. Judgmental Jeff Durbin, you. Yeah. Jeff Durbin, James White, God forbid. I bet you he is too. If you think I'm joking and lying, it's easy to look up. They justify drinking alcohol. I mean, what in the world? 
And these are the hypocrites who preach on lordship salvation. These are the hypocrites where Paul Washer makes you doubt your salvation, makes you think you got to forsake the world, deny the world, take up your cross and follow Jesus. And after they do a rap concert, then Paul Washer says, you know, uh, I sense Jesus Christ was in this room. You're on crack, man. Now, you notice I go really hard. See? You know why? I told you what I go really hard on. I really go hard on people who are responsible for the word of God and people's souls. They've depended on these people like pious, great, godly men. And you know what? I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they love Jesus, that they're sincere people. But guess what? Sincere people can still damage people's lives. You think Peter the hermit that, uh, you know, wasn't, didn't we hear him about our world history class? This guy was a sincere, pious person ministering to Muslims and then the Greek world and the, everybody, the poor. But you know what happened at the end? One of the worst wars in history in the Crusades. So many peasants and poor people died. You don't, uh, here's the easy question. You don't think Satan can't use sincere people? Well, then uh, how are we supposed to judge which person's right and wrong? Very simple. There's no other truth, and it's not by what I say. I can yell and rant, but I could be lying to you. Yes, yes, yes. you better nod your heads, okay? And the same thing with John MacArthur, Ray Comfort, and Paul Washer. All these guys are in the same pressured situation like I'm at. I'll tell you how you judge it. Why don't you look at this book? Read your Bible. Christians aren't reading their Bibles. They're looking at the lives of men and they think that they're, they're pious and they love Jesus and they judge uh, these preachers by their pious lives and they think, oh, that's scripture. That's what Jesus wants. And you listen to these preachers and then when a person like Ravi Zacharias falls apart, the Christian world weeps and cries and they think that they lost Jesus and that Christianity is not worth it anymore and that Ravi Zacharias' apologetics that this was all manipulation and it's not true. What are you looking at? Amen, you got to be looking at the word of God. I don't get shaken about Ravi Zacharias' scandal. A lot of his apologetics, why were they right? They match with the word of God. I'm judging what he says by the book. Amen. So who cares? I mean, do you see the problem with this doctrine? Yes. You're not looking at the work of Jesus Christ. You're looking at the work of man. That's the whole point of this Calvinism nonsense. Lordship salvation. This uh, denying of one saved, always saved. You're always looking at your work. What a lot of pressure in your life. Why not look at, look at the work of Jesus Christ? He loved you enough to die for you. Why? Because he knows you can't do it yourself. All right, so uh, let's look at other passages here. It's grievous, so... Uh, my next question, let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. What are you going to do with verses that says grace has zero works? All right, my next question. Answer this one. What are you going to do with the Bible that says faith and grace for saved Christians must have zero works. There's no work consisted in this one for salvation. Because work is totally opposite from faith and grace. That's why God says, I have to do this first and then this one after that. You see that? But people, they judge you by your works to see if you're truly saved by faith and grace. That's your problem, man. You better watch out for that. Okay, um, look at Romans 11, verse 6. You heard the pretty saying, you know, it's not, it's not by works, but it is a faith that works. You notice that? That's a saying. It's not by works, but it's a grace that works. That's a pretty saying. But guess what? I can pull you. If you doubt me, I have a question for you. I like to add this too. All right. Question number five. What makes you different from the cults who say that? Now, I wish I can pull up the quotes to you so that the people will believe me, but why don't you look it up yourself? Look at the quotes of Seventh-day Adventist churches on salvation. 
Look at the quotes of Catholic churches about salvation by faith and grace. Look at their quotes. I, I'm challenging you, the Mormon church. Look at their quote on salvation. You know what? You're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked and you're going to be dumb enough to think, these guys are saved Christians. You know why they? You know why? Because they say this. They say, it's false. We never taught salvation by works. We taught that salvation is by grace through what Jesus did on the cross. You don't believe me? I'll show you quotes one day. But I've done that in so many other videos in the past. All right? But when I showed you, when, uh, if you look at these quotes, you think they're saved Christians. Wait a minute. Then what's going to stop you from holding hands with these cults? Which is probably why Ravi Zacharias with the Mormon church and the Catholic church, he never denounced them as cult. And he said, you better be very careful with those wordings. What's going to stop the new world order with all religions uniting? Yeah. Scary thought. Now, uh, if, you, if, if there are people who don't believe me or who want those quotations, not online, all right? I can't pull up those quotes, okay? But you just have to look at my past videos, and I've given quotes on that one. But uh, I'll give it to you guys. And you know what's even scary? I have some people here who are my witnesses. You know what, you know what I did? I blanked out the names of these quotes, too. I blanked out Ray Comfort's name, John MacArthur's name, the Catholic Church name, the Jehovah Witness name, and Seventh-day Adventist. And I told them, pick and choose which one's cult and which one's a saved Christian. And where they thought it was a Catholic quote, they were surprised it was John MacArthur. All right, I can't prove it here. You onlineers, uh, you can... Uh, you, uh, you can cry and complain about that, saying that, you know, oh, he's just carrying it too far. Just research the quotes. That's all I ask. All right, anyway, uh, let's go back here. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. The Bible says, and if by grace, then what? Is it what? No more of works. Now, keep reading. Otherwise, what? Grace is no more grace. Then you get rid of the meaning of grace if you say it's a grace that works. But keep reading. You even get rid of the definition of works, too. <laughs> You know that? If you put grace in there, you're not just disgracing grace, you're disgracing works too. Because they're totally separate categories. Keep reading. But if it be a works, then is it what? No more. If you're saying this, then there should be zero grace then. Otherwise, what? Work is no more work. Now look at Romans 4. Romans 4. Romans 4, verse 4 through 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 through 5. What's the difference with Christians or cults? That's why some of you onliners, it's so sad, you can't tell the difference, can you? And you think that they're all the saved Christians like we are. And that the real enemy out there is those that are trying to force the vaccines on us. And it's all these globalists and liberals. Oh, for crying out loud, man. You don't think that... The devil that he's just used, uh, he, that's just one part of the enemy. Do you know how many enemies the devil has? You are so gullible. You are so gullible. You know what Satan has used throughout the past history? He has used religions. You know what Jesus Christ was against? Not, uh, the secular government at that time was not Jesus' number one enemy. And that's what deceived all you onliners. It's, it's the current government system in our world. That wasn't Jesus' focus. You know what it was? His own people's religion. That was his number one enemy. Talk about divisive. Jesus, we're all in this together. We have to overpower the Roman government. I mean, they're oppressing your people, the Jews. Aren't you the Messiah? Aren't you the king? No, you need to get right with God first. Circumcise there of your hearts. These sacrifices, uh, I would not, and, you know, Jesus didn't care about how he treated the Sabbath and healing people, and then he got all these religious people worked up. That's right. Just like what I'm doing right now. I'm working you up, right? But see, you, you know what the mentality is? You can't go against the rest of the devil's enemies if God's people are not fixed first. Uh, let me get... Uh, uh, Oh, I have to give verses, otherwise people are going to judge me, right? All right, so let me read 1 Peter real quick. You can write this down if you don't believe me, all right? 1 Peter chapter 4. You know what God says judgment must begin with? Yes, judgment must begin with the house of God. That's first, not, not the outside lost world out there. Judgment must begin with the house of God first. Look at, uh, it's the, you can write down 1 Peter chapter 4, 
verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall, be, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? See that? It's us first. We have to fix ourselves first. Then we can hit the other ones out there. Okay. Now, uh, Romans chapter 4. I just lost my text here. Okay. Look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. See that? If you do works, God says that you're in debt. You're not saved by grace. But to him that worketh not, let's say that you don't work, all right? Oh, then you're lost. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What are you going to do with those verses? All right, my last challenge, and then we'll close it off for the night. Now, this is where they're going to go, okay? They are going to go. You know what they're going to pull up on you? They're going to pull you Bible verses. Yes, scriptures in the Bible that talk about, well, you know, if you don't do works for your salvation if, or if we don't see that out of your life, you're not genuinely saved, all right? All right, I'm sick and tired of onlineers trying to dedicate videos attacking yours truly and pulling up verses, which I already answered a long time ago. It's called the doctrine of dispensationalism. Just watch our video. It's called Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation. Please watch that video. It'll go from beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation and tell you the doctrine that not all verses apply to you. They apply for different people in different time periods. Right. Now, if you are really insane to not believe what I just said, then that's not true. In your Bible, it shows Old Testament and New Testament. Okay? Here's another thing. The Bible says if someone takes God's name in vain, you should stone them to death. There's a difference of time periods, obviously. Uh, you want me to tell you something even more? Okay, God, in, in a verse in the Bible, God told Noah, build an ark to rescue you and your family. Is that a verse for you? I don't see any of you building boats out here. And if, if you do happen to build a home here, good luck through San Francisco Bay Area with the building codes and home codes and seeking their permission and etc. Good luck for you on that one, man. Right, the verses are uh, divided. The Bible says you're not supposed to have mixed garments, all right, at the book of Leviticus. Oh, guilty, all right, crying out loud. Here's a, here's a good one. Here's a good one. The Bible says that at the book, at the Old Testament law, that men are not to cut their hair. They're to leave it long. But in the New Testament, for Christians, God says it's a shame for man to have long hair, so we have to cut it short, which is why you notice we do that. So what in the world? Oh, there's a contradiction. It's a different time period. You know why Jews were supposed to be a peculiar people? Because during their days, the pagans were the ones who were shorning the hairs and stuff like that. That's why Catholic monks, I don't know if you knew this, they had that circle, bald circle. Uh, during the pagan days, they did that. So then God says, no, you have to grow your hair long. But in New Testament Christianity, God says, no, because I despise universal appearance. Because he wants a distinction of man and woman. So because of that, that's why he said woman's hair is long, 1 Corinthians 11, man's hair short. Why? To tell the difference with a man and woman. Why? Because when we're looking at your back, we want to know immediately that's a guy or that's a girl. Unless you want us to look at certain body areas, that's not a good testimony. See, so that's why the Lord, he did all this. So there's no doubt it's a different time period. That's a point. Uh, easy one. Animal sacrifices. Do we do that today? No. All right. But in the Old Testament, they did. Why? Because our sacrifice is not animals. It's Jesus Christ. So there's no doubt. There's no doubt there were differences in time periods and verses and with the group of people. So uh, my last challenge is this, is... Any verse that you have proving works for salvation, all right, how, uh, is there a single verse that will not apply to something that is of a Jew or different time period? So is it a different time period? 
Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism for salvation? Did you read three verses behind it? Three verses after that? It's for the house of Israel and all the Jews that are scattered around the world. James chapter 2, verse uh, 20 through 24. Do you see that? How by works a man is justified and not by faith only. That verse, go to James 1.1 1, 1, where it says, To the twelve tribes, Israel scattered abroad. James 5.3, for the tribulation last days. It's that simple. Well, what about the passage where it talks about uh, where Jesus said in Matthew 19 to the rich young ruler, Forsake all you have and come and follow me. That's Old Testament before Jesus died on the cross. It's that simple. Why? Because the Jew is not the same as the Christian church. That's why the Jews, what? They got mad at Paul. You know why they got mad at Paul? He was teaching things that were different now. It was something that's non-Jewish. It's Gentile. God switched his program from Jew to Gentile. That's the reason why. So there were Christian doctrines in place. Any verse that you pull up in the Bible, find me Romans through Philemon. That's to the church. All the verses you read from Romans to Philemon, Paul is addressing to a Christian or he'll address it to the church at the very first five verses he'll say that. It's either to a Christian person or to a church. All the other books is about Jews. It's about apostles who minister to Jews. Even the general epistles, James, Peter, James, John, and all that, the Bible says their ministry was to Jews. See, so there's no doubt about that. So there's no way you can overthrow this doctrine. I don't know how. I don't know how. And then combine that with the video that I have. It's called Once Saved, Always Saved. Please watch that video. And there are just too many verses that you can't lose your salvation. But I've tackled the reasons here, these tough questions that they have to answer. Answer that before you criticize, please. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings have uh, been a blessing to the hearers, and I pray it did not offend them. Your word says, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. I pray that it will be to the people who listen tonight and to those online, touch their hearts with the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.